Hi everyone, a happy Purim. Today, over the, around the world, the Jewish people are celebrating the holiday of Purim. However, it has actually universal lessons for all of us. So we will be speaking exactly about that, the Kabbalistic secret to drinking responsibly. This program is dedicated by Robert Klein in loving memory of his sister, Judith Sten, an extraordinary and most loving sister, mother, wife, and daughter. We've been polling and asking people the question, is intoxication compatible with spirituality? You know, on one hand, you find in many different cultures, ancient cultures, and even, to, to, even in modern times, where there was some form of rituals associated with spiritual states, higher states and altered states of consciousness, rituals that were connected either with alcohol or with um, what was called plant medicine of different sorts that helped a person achieve an altered state, a uh, higher state, a deeper state of awareness on one hand. On the other hand, some people see it as taboo, the idea of getting drunk intoxicated. Um, we're, not, we're not even talking about addiction at this point. We'll mention, we'll discuss that in a moment. Seems antithetical. A spiritual journey should really be a natural one. Why do you need to induce it and, um, and essentially use, alt, use foreign substances to achieve that a state? And I'm not talking about the taboos and stigmas connected to people who may have their own... Uh, phobias or inhibitions just the very concept a certain pure purity in the journey itself so i want to talk about that and as i said the kabbalistic secret to drinking responsibly when it comes to purim this holiday of purim we find the concept actually that it says that a person is responsible obligated to get intoxicated that's the words to get drunk um, to the point that they cannot distinguish between the blessing of Mordechai and the curse of Haman, which itself is doubly bizarre. First of all, what kind of obligation is that to get intoxicated? And is Judaism advocating that concept that one needs to drink in order to get to a higher state of consciousness? And what does it mean not to be able to distinguish between two such opposites, between good and evil? I mean, Mordechai and Haman represented an, an, the a diametric opposites of right and wrong, good and evil, genocide, and peace, that's the entire story. So all this needs to be really clarified. When you look into the Bible itself, you find that generally speaking, even though wine is used in ritual, but wine is always seen as a dangerous substance. When I say dangerous, you find, for example, one of the opinions of uh, that the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden was a grapevine. Now, had they eaten it, had they had they eaten that fruit? responsibly in the right time, it could have been used to make a benediction, to sanctify it, a blessing when we make Kiddush and the wine on the Shabbat. But they drank it prematurely, and that was considered a grave sin. You find the story of Noah. After the flood, he um, gets intoxicated to the point that his, his own son either castrates him, but they definitely abuse him. You find later the story in the Bible with Lot, the same with him getting intoxicated by his daughters, and he in turn is abused. So you don't find wine always in a positive sense. It has to be controlled. It has to be disciplined. And then, of course, there's the ultimate story, the story of the two sons of Aaron, the high priest, who in the day of the dedication of the sanctuary, the temple, they wanted to go in and in their great ecstasy and their great passion and desire to connect to the transcendent they got intoxicated. And they actually, the, the, the words of the Bible are, they, got, they were consumed by a strange fire, an alien, an alien fire, which has been used as a euphemism at times of drugs and other substances. Strange fire, an alien fire that consumed them and killed them, essentially in their high. Then you have more such episodes of People using substances, and not in a positive way, to the point that the Bible tells Aaron, that God tells Moses to tell Aaron, if you want to enter the Holy of Holies, here's the way to do it. 
and he gives them very clear instructions and disciplines of how to enter the Holy of Holies and not be consumed as his sons were. So here's the big question. If some of these substances can help a person achieve a higher state, why not use them? And this is, of course, the, the topic as well of, of Purim. Now, it's interesting, even though we do have the obligation I mentioned about Purim, but generally speaking, Judaism frowns upon intoxication or any form of loss of control to the point that during the holidays, there were messengers sent by the courts to make sure that when their celebration was taking place, there were people making sure that everything was disciplined, that there wasn't frivolous behavior and inappropriate behavior, especially in the sexual arena, because that's what happens. When you usually get to, there's a very thin line, as they say, between spirituality, sensuality, and sexuality. And without clear guidelines and disciplines, you find in many spiritual systems a lot of abuse and hurt in that regard. So while we all aspire, or at least those of us that aspire to higher spiritual states, we also know that great care has to be taken because you cannot become, if you remain the arrogant person you are, and you become someone that can exploit and abuse others in the name of spirituality, that can be even more dangerous because you're using a sublime force like that. So this is a very critical topic in general when we're talking about spiritual enlightenment. So let me explain it in a using, this is essentially taken from some of the texts and some of the mystical discourses, we'll call the Hasidic discourses, namely one that I'm referring to, one that was delivered, actually the story of Aaron, the children of Aaron, was delivered in the year, it was the year um, 1889, yes, 1889, in, uh, in, the, in the town of Lubavitch, which was in uh, essentially Belarus, White Russia, what it was, was called at the time. A very powerful discourse delivered by Rabbi Sholem Ber, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, which is based on other Hasidic discourses. But the key principle is this, that in the, the course of life, we human beings consist of many, obviously multiple and many forces and components that define who we are. But specifically, we have two voices, two forces within us. One we'll call the voice of survival. The voice, the need to survive, to exist, to pay, to pay our bills, to make ends meet, to eat, to drink, to sleep, to exercise. Essentially, all the needs of living in this, in, in, in this world. Then there's the transcendent voice, the transcendent need to rise above the routine, the humdrum, the monotony of life. And we all seek our transcendence in many different ways. It can be on a very basic level through reading, through literature, through art, through music, through love, through romance, through sexuality, some through faith, religion, and some through other transcendental methods and approaches. Some do turn to substances, as I said, different cultures that turn to less. Lately, there's been a lot about psychedelics and plant medicine, as I mentioned. All in the name of a transcendent experience to get beyond, to use the words of, of William Blake, that when you cleanse the doors of perception, all that you're left with is what man sees is the way things are truly are, and they are infinite. Paraphrasing a bit. To the point that, that Aldous Huxley wrote his book, Doors of Perception, and actually one of the great rock bands, The Doors, was based on that, on that book and that poem of William Blake. Now it's interesting, Jim Morrison, as, um, uh, as uh, Jimi Hendrix, as well as Janis Joplin, what they call the, the 24 Club, all burned out, literally, through OD'd, basically at age 24, geniuses in their fields. And I always found fascinating the parallel to the biblical story. They too were seeking something the beyond. I mean, some say Rothko, the famous artist, as well, committed suicide in the late 60s, even though he was at the peak of his career, also seeking the beyond. I mean, you seek the beyond, the challenges that we also have to deal with being grounded in this world. And that's where the, the, the conflict, the tension, the tension of living that mundane, routine life. At the same time, if you're a deep spirit, hungering, thirsting for the transcendent is not an easy tension to resolve to the point that it becomes almost impossible for some 
And this is indeed the reason that some just cannot make it. I'm not saying it's deliberate or not deliberate, I'm not getting now into emotional things and other psychological factors at work. So the way it's described in the Kabbalistic and in the Hasidic literature is that these two forces are the two parts of the soul. And we'll, I'll give it the Hebrew name, Rotze and Shuv. It comes from a verse in the book of Ezekiel, where in his vision, one of his mystical visions, he describes energy, spiritual energy, and he describes it that he sees the energy running to and fro. Rotze v'shuv in Hebrew means tension and resolution. You know, think of the symbol of the lightning bolt, electricity, a positive and a negative. There's that tension that a person seeks, that angst seeking. Like, like think of a flame, a flame flickering, reaching, licking the air, and then the wick that grounds the flame. And a, and a balanced life requires both of them. So if you have if you only have one or the other, that will be an imbalanced life and can be quite dangerous. I remember once a, a doctor I knew, a very sweet, sweet guy, used to come to my classes. He had a, but he had a personally difficult life. And I remember he once said to me, Rabbi, can you give me a blessing to have one day of peace, one day of calm? He was a heart doctor, cardiologist. So I said to him with a smile, I said, you mean like a flat line? He said, no, 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 not that calm. Because we know a flat line means there's no heartbeat. In other words, a cardiogram, if you look at a cardiogram, you'll see that perfect balance. A healthy heart is a wave, is a peak and a valley, but they're perfectly balanced. If the peaks are too high or the valley is too low and it's erratic, that means there's a problem. The same thing with our breathing, exhale, inhale. In other words, the very energy, the very marrow, the very uh, essence of life is defined like all energy, by a positive and a negative, a tension and a resolution. Now, we all need a healthy measure of angst in life, or else we will not be motivated, will not be driven. As much as we dream about lying on a beach and just relaxing with no worries in the world, try it out for a while. A healthy human spirit cannot survive with that alone. On the other hand, just to have, in other words, animal bliss is just not our domain. On the other hand, to have constant tension to the point of anxiety, that also can be a problem. So finding that perfect balance is the challenge. So the question is, how do you do that? And how do you avoid the problem of, in a sense, almost like the desperate search for reaching transcendence when you're really a very spiritual person? How do you, how do you avoid getting overwhelmed by it to the point that it can burn you out, to the point that the fire can consume you, as in the, in the examples I gave earlier? And the answer is the concept of bittel, a word I've used quite often. It's a Hebrew word, but it's hard to really translate it in the English language, but it's a combination of humility, modesty, but I like the best way to describe it is to suspending yourself in the face of something greater than yourself. In other words, even though a transcendent person will often say, I'm a spiritual person, they'll often say, well, that's superior than being a materialistic person driven by money and vanity and power and ego. But you could also be spiritually arrogant if it's about me. The whole true point of transcendence is that, that transcendence is not just another need that you're filling. It's not just an ego, another ego trip. It's actually transcending your very transcendence that you are losing yourself in the presence of something beyond you. And if that is lacking, the trouble can come. So in other words, the key to a transcendent experience is that you put yourself aside, that you... The thing was, the sons of Aaron were great people. There's no question about it. It was not, they were not, low, they, they, were not um, they were not sinners. They were great souls. The thing is, they wanted it too much. And you have to have a certain element of discipline, a certain element of restraint. That, 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 that pause, that before you enter the Holy of Holies, before you experience a transcendent experience, it's not just, I need it because my soul is so hungry. So in a sense, there's like the material life, the first voice, the second voice, the transcendent, but then there's the, the real, the third dimension, which is beyond the transcendent. That's why there's the concept of holiness, sanctity that's greater than spirituality. The goal is not a spiritual experience. The goal is a holy experience, a divine experience, which is neither spiritual nor material. It's not about you. It's about being absorbed in something beyond you. But you and you have to enter with a certain element of 
discipline, an element of humility, an element of r- gratitude. Cannot want, if you want it too much, then it can be an extension of your own ego. And this is what happens. You see many people in the 60s who went with the good intentions to find that transcendent experience, then it became too much. They became selfishly transcendent to the point of hurting others. And this is the care that has to be taken. So that's why, from the Jewish perspective, from the biblical perspective, this spiritual experience has to come with a lot of preparation and discipline. You can't just induce it with alcohol or with a drug or any other fashion or way. You need to earn your way or else it's something that's being superimposed. If you haven't earned your way, it's not yours. It's like, I just use a, a I guess it's somewhat of a, gr- a, a, a grotesque example. Why can't little children be intimate with each other? Technically, they can have sex, but they're not ready for it emotionally. The energy, the intensity of it is just too much. They need the containers. Now, I'm not getting now what age exactly is a person fitting, but everything, everyone can agree that certain experiences require a proper preparation or else you become overwhelmed by it and you don't know how to internalize it, how to integrate it. The same is with the spiritual experience. There's a maturity that's required, a certain seasoning, a certain element that cannot just be another pleasurable act. It's much more than that. You're entering into the Holy of Holies and therefore the, the, the Torah frowns upon inducing it in any possible way. Earn your way. Pray, meditate, be kind to others. Earn your way to enter these deeper transcendent levels. However, that does not mean that there aren't substances that God endowed with certain powers. But that doesn't mean we have to indulge in them. Indulge for sure not. Maybe at times, especially if there's medical reasons or other reasons. So that's why there are times like on Purim it says, yes, but only with great care. First, you have to reach great high states of consciousness before you can reach super consciousness. And then when it says that the obligation is to reach a place where you cannot distinguish between the blessing of Mordechai and the curse of Hama, of Haman, it doesn't mean that you can't distinguish between good and evil. We know what Charles Manson did. And we know what others have done once you blur those boundaries. It means that you get to a state where you don't experience good and evil in a personal way. It means that even the negative things in your life become, become uh, propel you and become springboards to teach you deeper things, th- deeper experiences. Of course there's such a thing as good and evil, and we have to avoid it by all means. It's not like, okay, I've, I've reached such a state of high, I can do anything to anyone. No, that's not acceptable. That's exactly actually quite dangerous is that you've reached a state of consciousness, a higher state of consciousness, where you're not even aware where subject and object melt into each other, that you're just experiencing. It's like when you become absorbed reading a book or listening to a song, where you don't even realize you're turning pages because you become one with what you're experiencing here. So the point being is that now the evil, of course, has to be completely obliterated. The evil of Haman, the evil of genocide, the evil of killing people. But the lessons you learn from it, the fact that you had to experience it or you went through that challenge makes you a greater person. And you come to a point where you realize it's not just the positive things in your life, but even the setbacks that all become part of your narrative. Just to explain a bit what that means. But the key point I want to emphasize again is so the Kabbalistic secret to drinking responsibly is understanding that it's not the drink. If you're drinking to get high, you're drinking just to drink, to escape, to numb yourself, that is for forbidden, as we say. That's forbidden. That's not acceptable. Because then it's about you and your needs and it's just another extension of that. If, however, under the right circumstances and it's done as a mitzvah, as a divine, a divine edict that tells you in certain times and not in a point of intoxication where you're out of control. Out of control is never a good sign. When you, but, but, but being able to suspend your intellectual structures to be, suspend your rationalization of things and understanding reality like the infinite once the doors of perception are cleansed, that's a whole other story. That's coming with bittel, with tremendous awe and tremendous sanctity and tremendous humility. Then that, that experience, then under those guidelines, that allows you to be able to channel and harness whatever that experience is. But it's never as a mean, as an ends as of its own. 
It's always a means to experience something beyond yourself. It's not, to, it's not just to get high or drunk, just to get drunk or high because it makes you feel good or because you want to escape your reality. It's part of the, the effort, a, lo, a lifelong effort of, the, of searching for transcendence. And it's only someone that has that years and years of discipline and years and years of seasoning and maturity that can even attempt to go into a place like that. And even that with great care, as we learn from the children of Aaron that I mentioned before. So bottom line is, is intoxication compatible with spirituality? The answer is no, it's not. Spirituality and the seeking of transcendence is its own particular journey. Intoxication by the very definition means, or addiction, even worse, means that you are dependent on something else. So you become a slave to the thing that you're addicted to. And the true nature of transcendence is the exact opposite. You have not become a slave at all. You have become absorbed in a reality greater than your own. Not something you cannot live without. Not something that if you, um, you, 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 um, you deprive yourself of it, you'll feel, you'll feel withdrawal. No, that is a dependency, whether it's a physical dependence, a psychological dependence. We're talking about reaching great higher states, and that's the goal. When a person is reaching those higher states in order to be, go beyond their ego, beyond their self-interest, and beyond all, those, all the vices that define the limitations and the, sometimes the ugliness and absurdity of human life, that's a whole other story. So Purim is a journey to that place. Part of it can, in certain circumstances, if the person is ready and mature enough, sometimes that can happen, is a cup of wine can help a person achieve that. But it has to be done again with that discipline, not as a social scene and not as a party and not as having fun and not as removing your inhibitions so you can interact with others. It's about a very pure intent, which may not be something that most of us have been exposed to, but nevertheless, talking about this, I think, has great value because each of us can then apply that to our personal lives, each in our own way. Now, there's so much more that can be said on this topic. I hope I touched upon it and did some justice to a big topic like this. And I you know, would have loved, I'm always fascinated when I hear the Jim Morrisons and the Jimi Hendrix and, um, <clears throat> and uh, the, the, the Janis Joplins are, and others who may not have OD'd but definitely burned their brains out, whether it's Miles Davis, some others. I would love to be able to sit and chat with them and talk to them about this because I wonder what it would have been had they had the containers, had they been able to harness and channel that enormous infinite energy into some grounded in some grounded way what would that what could have come of that because that's the ultimate goal and it's definitely doable there are people who've reached that place but you know um everything we learn from everything we learn from those also like i said the children of Aaron, what happened with them and hopefully we can all learn how to balance in our own lives to have that neat that that critical experience of the transcendent while also grounding it and internalizing into our systems into our lives happy purim everyone happy transcendence learn to balance and learn to balance the rotsi and the shuv the tension and the resolution each in our own way there's a lot more material on this topic that i have addressed over the years you can check it out at meaningfullife.com and uh, please love to hear your feedback your thoughts your comments and take the poll that we put up, is intoxication compatible with spirituality? Share your thoughts, and please share with your friends, share with others. Um, subscribe to our, our growing YouTube channel, as well as to our other offerings, and only have a happy life, a celebrated life, and let's stay in touch. Thank you so much. Be blessed, and be well.